please remain standing and, and join me in the call to worship. The Spirit is here among us.
trouble. She's done something that she is not supposed to be doing. And there are a bunch of people. Have you ever seen someone do something wrong and you wanted to tell? And sometimes it's there's good tattletailing and then there's the tattletailing that we're just doing because we really want to get someone in trouble. That kind of tattletailing. There is a good tattletailing. But in this situation, they were in the city and this woman did something really wrong and the people were so mad. They were so mad because they knew that it would make Jesus very angry. So they gathered her together. And you know what they did back in Bible times when they did something wrong? Well, sometimes they stoned people, which means they put her in the middle and they were going to throw rocks at her. And yeah, I think I'd rather be grounded from my Xbox. Me too. So they're getting ready to throw rocks at her. And Jesus sees what's going on and he comes up and he's like, what is going on? What is happening? And they say, this woman, this woman, look what she did. She, this is not okay. She has sinned and we are going to make her pay for her sins. Guess what Jesus says? Jesus said, does he say, go ahead, throw the first rock? Nope. Jesus says, whoever has not sinned, cast the first stone, which cast means throw the first stone at her. And so these people, they're getting ready to rock, and they take the rock, and they're ready, and then they're thinking about it. And again, he said to the whoever has not sinned, cast or throw the first stone at her. Just to throw. Guess how many rocks were thrown? Zero. Why? Because everybody has sinned. We all sin, right? It's not a good thing. It's not something we should be like, hey, I've sinned. And that's a good thing, right? It's not a good thing. But Jesus said, his, his next words were, go, it, go and sin no more. So he's saying, go, go on with your life and let the woman go and don't sin anymore. Well, God knows that we're human and we're going to sin. But what do we do when we sin? What are we supposed to do when we sin? What are we supposed to ask for? Forgiveness. We're supposed to ask for forgiveness. And so God is reminding us that even through all of that, God loves us more than anything in the whole entire world. And God had grace on that woman. And God had grace on those people. And those people knew, hey, you know what? We're all in this together. We are all the same. And this week in our after school program, we've been talking about what it means, what respect means. And we shared the story of when Jesus had the disciples wash his feet, right? Why did he wash? Why did he do that? Do you remember Marley? He did it because he wanted to show that he was with them and that nobody is better than anybody else, right? And it reminds us that to remember that everybody that we meet, no matter who it is, they are one of us. God created all the people, and that we should have respect for them, and treat them the way we want to be treated, and be nice to them, and help people when they need help, and do whatever we can, but to remember that we're all in this together, and, and to respect and love, and more importantly, to share God's love with all people that we meet. Can you do that this week? This week, I challenge all of you to find one person that you can do something special for. Maybe not even tell them. At the rock, we told the kids, like, sneakily, like, go home and do something that's not expected. And one of them came back and said, my mom asked me if I was sick because I cleaned my room. <laughs> and I didn't tell her that it was really for this assignment. But I want you to see not only what you do, but I want you to look at their face and I want you to see how, it, how they react to it, okay? Because when you love other people and when we pass that on, it's going to go to the next person and the next person, and then guess what? We'll have less grumpy people in this world. Because you got to smile, right? When God is good and all that's good. All right, let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for these children, and we thank you for teaching us the lessons. More importantly, the lesson that you love us and that you walk with us through all that we go through. May we leave this place being your hands and your feet, and may we continue to share your love of love and grace for all people that we meet. Thank you, God, for these children, thank you for this church, and thank you for this world. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people say, Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can go to children.
Today's gospel lesson comes from the book of John, uh, chapter 7, verse 53, through chapter 8, verse 11. If you can follow along in your few Bibles on page 870, if you would, please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. And Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he returned to the temple. All the people gathered around him. And he sat down and talked to them. The legal experts and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. Placing her in the center of the group, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone women like this. What do you say? They said this to test him, because they wanted a reason to bring an accusation against him. Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground with his finger. They continued to question him, so he stood up and replied, Whoever hasn't sinned should throw the first stone. Then deep down again, he wrote on the ground. Those who heard him went away one by one. Beginning with the elders, finally only Jesus and the woman were left in the middle of the crowd. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Is there no one to condemn you? She said, No one, sir. Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, don't sin anymore. The word of God for the people of God. Please join me in the musical response. Love divine, all love's excelling, found in hymnal, found in the hymnal on uh, page 384 on the screen above. So each one of us experiences conflict. 
uh, to some degree, both in our lives and uh, daily. It's an internal struggle, but also an external struggle that we often, often face, often face. Everyone, on a daily basis, has conflict. <laughs> Whether it's be whether it's like a, it's a and what, where conflict comes from is like a gap in what we want and what we are experiencing. Uh, it can be as simple as uh, going through the Starbucks line and I want my coffee now and I have to wait for it. It could be going to a barbecue restaurant and you learn that they're out of uh, your favorite dish. Conflict exists there at the simplest level. It exists. So at the basic level, conflict is a gap between what we want and what we are experiencing at any moment. And so in the scripture today, we see how Jesus responds to conflict. We see how the Pharisees respond to conflict, but we also see how the woman responds to conflict. And I think this difference that is shown in scripture can show us how we should, when we respond to conflict in the way Jesus does, act in conflict. And so one thing before we dive into the story, I want to look at the Gospel of John and just give you a couple of overarching themes of the Gospel of John that help when we come to this story that we read in John 7:53 through 8:11. And that John was a wordsmith. So we have a couple wordsmiths in this congregation that are very good with words, and their words have multiple meaning and they have depth to them. That is the Gospel of John. Every word is specifically chosen and has both the surface level meaning, but also has a deeper theological meaning, tying it to other scriptures, the Old Testament, and tying it all together. So it's a holistic approach to scripture. So it comes to no surprise that the scripture we read today has a surface level meaning as we can read through it. That's very profound, but it also has a deeper and richer meaning that when we dive into and examine uh, the cross references of scripture, it provides an extra oomph to the message that John is saying. So in the gospel of John, Jesus is portrayed as a prophet, the true teacher of the law, while the scribes and Pharisees in this story are trying to disprove him or discredit him. And so let's begin by looking at 753 through 81, the opening, opening of this passage of scripture. And it says, they each went to their own homes and Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. I mean, that sounds pretty self-explanatory, right? But the, in the days before, it had been the Feast of the Tabernacle. And so the people of uh, Jerusalem, Christians, had been celebrating and partying. It's like if they had harvest home for seven days straight, and you couldn't go home, but you had to build a cot here and sleep at the church. And then on the seventh day, you could go home and sleep in your comfy bed. Can you imagine that? And so that's what they're doing. Most of the, the, the people that were joining in the celebration went home to their comfy beds, beds that they were used to, but Jesus didn't have that luxury. Jesus went outside of the city into the Mount of Olives, where he spent a lot of time uh, in his ministry. And it's a time where he, he, sought, he sought to connect with God on the Mount of Olives, but he also wept and experienced many emotions uh, that would follow after this story. And so it was a place where Jesus would have been familiar and going to and from one of his best friend's house, his best friend Lazarus. And so it's a familiarity, but also a, a, the unknown in a place he commonly went to be in communion with God. And so let's continue on this journey. Uh, in verse 2, it says, Early in the morning he returned to the temple. All the people gathered around him, and he sat down and taught, him, taught them. And so many scholars point to this early in the morning part of this second verse of John chapter 8. And they point to the beginning of John where Jesus is portrayed as the light of the world. He is coming into the world. And so I want to read that scripture to you. It's John 1, 9 through 13. And it says, The true light that shines on all people was coming into the world. The light was in the world, and the world became into being through the light. But the world didn't recognize the light. The light came to his own people, and his own people didn't welcome him. But those who did welcome him, those believed in his name, he authorized to become God's children, born not from blood, not from human desire or passion, but born 
from God. And so there's a couple er distinctions in this, uh, in this passage of Scripture. It says that this common English Bible is the version that we read. It says, he returned to the temple. The NIV version of the Bible, the New International Version, says he appeared again in the temple. And the NRSV version says he came again to the temple. It says all three are trying to say this is a place where Jesus commonly went. This was not an unexpected thing for Jesus to be in the temple. He kept on returning to teach and to guide and to lead Christians. Jesus had been teaching just before this story in the temple about how he was, te he was the living water that everyone needed. And most more commonly, probably like the rabbis that Jesus had learned from, he was probably sitting down teaching them in the true rabbinic tradition. And so the stage is now set for conflict. We see Jesus in the temple teaching and leading and prophesying. How would Jesus respond to what would follow? Would he fall for the Pharisees' trap and get roped into their drama? Let's continue as the legal experts enter the scene and make their first appearance in verse 3 through 6 and what a lot of callers, scholars call is the trap. The legal experts and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, placing her in the center of the group. They said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery, and the law of Moses commanded us to stone women like this. What do you say? They said this to test him because they wanted a reason to bring an accusation against him. And so going back to the, the festival, and so this is the night in between the festival and the next day. I imagine the legal experts and Pharisees, maybe they went home to their own house and they, were, they spent all night, maybe they were scheming and plotting. How are we going to trap Jesus? How are we going to use the word of God to trap Jesus. One scholar says this about the legal experts and Pharisees' motives. Their first concern is with entrapping Jesus, not with the law or just not with the law or justice or even the woman. The law, justice, and the woman were being exploited for the Pharisees and legal experts' ulterior motives of trapping Jesus and discrediting him. They made, they made it clear to Jesus in verse 5. They said, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone women like this. What do you say? They made it clear that Moses was on their side and wondered what Jesus, how Jesus might respond. This is the moment they had been waiting for, you might be thinking. They, would, they were ready to pounce, ready to hear what Jesus had to say. What would Jesus say or do? And at this moment, I'd like to hit the pause button on this, on this story. Jesus was immersed in the middle of conflict. He was smack dab in the middle of a confrontation with the legal experts and the Pharisees. Energy exists in conflict. Would Jesus be willing to go outside the triangle of drama that was trying to draw Jesus, the legal experts and Pharisees and the woman in? How was this energy of conflict going to be used? Was it going to be used for destruction and devastation or for compassion and accountability? Jesus had a, a choice like we have when we enter into things that are hard to do, things, things of conflict, difficult conversations, difficult decisions to do. We have a choice. Dr. Nate Rig Rigier, author of Compassionate Ac Accountability says, these are the two choices when conflict arises. We have the choice of drama, which is struggling against. It is a process of opposition and destruction. It is about taking sides, forming camps, viewing the struggle as a win-lose proposition, and adopting an ad adversarial attitude towards resolving this discrepancy between what we want and what we are getting. Or the struggle involved with conflict can be a process of mutuality and creation. It is about seeing the solution as a two-way street, viewing the struggle as an opportunity for a win-win outcome, and adopting an attitude of shared responsibility for resolving the discrepancy between what we want and what we are experiencing. 
Let's rejoin Jesus, the woman, and the legal experts, and the Pharisees, and see, what, see how this conflict played out. So we read in the second half of John 6 through 8, Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground with his finger. They continued to question him. So he stood up and replied, Whoever hasn't sinned, throw the first stone. Bending down again, he wrote on the ground. So if you're just paying attention to Jesus' posture throughout this, uh, throughout this story, he begins by sitting down teaching. He uh, bends down to write on the ground. He can, they continue to question him. He's kind of just sitting there. He continues to write on the ground. And then he gets up, bends down again. So if you pay attention to his posture, it can be pretty dizzying. Like, what does, what does this mean? What does this symbolize? Many scholars try to guess what Jesus wrote on the ground that day. But the truth is, no one, no one knows what Jesus wrote on the ground. It'd be interesting to know what he was writing on the ground. But I think the more you look at the Gospel of John and what, how writing on the ground uh, is portrayed throughout Scripture, we see what John is alluding to, what John is saying, hey, this is, this is important here. It's not just writing on the ground, but we read in the Old Testament that Jesus, that, that the law of the Lord in Deuteronomy, it was written by the finger of God. And so the, in Deuteronomy, the law was written by the finger of God. You notice what John says in this passage of Scripture? Jesus was writing on the ground with his finger. They continued to barrage Jesus with questions. So Jesus stood up and said, Whoever hasn't thrown the first stone... Whoever, whoever hasn't sinned should throw the first stone. Can you imagine Jesus going like this to each one of us here in this room, to the legal experts, to the Pharisees? Say, here you go. Here you go. You, if, since you don't have judgment, you throw the first stone. I think that what, how, what the, the power that might have had when he was talking to the legal experts, the Pharisees, but also what, it had, how it might, what the power it might have had for the woman standing there. So I would, when we make assumptions, I often make assumptions, jump to conclusions or judge people who might be different from me or have diff different perspectives than me. And it's a powerful image to think about here Jesus saying, here you go, Alex, cast the first stone. It tempers what we think, how divisive we can be, and when you go through conflict, if you go through that mindset of engaging and respecting the other person, it can make all the difference in the world. So once again, I want to bring us back to Jesus' posture. He, he's once again back on the ground as, a, as the conflict continues. Can you imagine how awkward this might have been for everyone involved? He's just they're continuing to talk to him, but he is still kind of hunched over, drawing on the ground. Uh, kind of, I wonder what he is, he is thinking. Maybe he's thinking, maybe he's just saying, I wonder what's, what's going to happen. How will, how will this play out? But he's just sitting there writing on the ground as this conflict ensues around him. And then finally, after he said, whoever hasn't said, sinned should throw the first stone, those who heard him went away, one by one, beginning with the elders, finally only Jesus and the woman were left in the middle of the crowd. The legal experts arrived loud and bolsterous, full of themselves in the beginning of this passage of scripture, ready to trap Jesus. And now you see them leaving in silence Maybe they recognize the wisdom of Jesus. Maybe they realize the, the sin that they have in their own lives. Maybe they've realized when they've jumped to conclusions, had assumptions. And so now all we see is Jesus and the woman. How would this play out? The legal experts responded by struggling against her and Jesus, by taking sides forming camps, 
seeing the conflict as a win-lose situation? How would Jesus respond now to this woman face to face? Jesus responded with compassion for the woman, but still held her accountable for what she did. Here's the conversation. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Is there no one to condemn you? She said, No one, sir. Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, don't sin anymore. I was thinking in these stories, it would have been natural for the woman to disappear when the Pharisees and legal experts disappeared. After all, uh, they were putting her on trial, and it had ended after they left. She was, would have been natural for her to leave. She was probably tired and terrified about what might happen to her. But she decided to stay. Perhaps she was intrigued by how Jesus handled the conflict, his mannerisms, his demeanor. Jesus rises and looks at the woman's inner eyes and says, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, don't sin anymore. We don't know what happened after this in this story to the woman. I'd like to think maybe she stayed in the temple to hear Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. But what we do know is that Jesus showed her compassion. We learn that compassion is not for the faint of heart. True compassion, the kind that allows conflict to create, is much more than empathy or caring, much more than going out of your way to help someone. Compassion requires humility, creativity, and courage. Compassion doesn't mean letting someone off the hook, feeling sorry for them, or loving them into good behavior. Compassionate accountability is the process of holding someone or yourself accountable. Compassion energizes us to co-create something amazing out of conflict. Compassion calls us to struggle with each other, finding a win-win for all involved. Will you please join me in prayer? God, we, we thank you for the compassion and accountability that you love us with today. May we still, may we expend that compassion to everyone, knowing that it's not the easiest. It is not letting others walk all over us. We see that in this story of Jesus, that Jesus both loved, cared deeply, extended compassion, but held people accountable for their actions. And we ask that you guide us and lead us today, tomorrow, the week, and in the months and years ahead. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship by singing Thy Word as a Lamp, which can be found in your hymnal on page 601, and the words will also be up on your screen.
this time, I'd like to invite Joe Lubas for the mission of the Good morning. As you all know, when I come to the podium, it's time to talk about finances, so sorry. Uh, but it is that time of the year again, and hopefully uh, in the congregation, everybody has gotten their pledge card. If you haven't received your pledge card for uh, 2019 giving, um, we do, and we can get you those. Um, so Tuesday, the Finance Committee will meet, and we will start the work on the 2019 budget. And uh, the pledge cards are critical to that process. The pledge cards um, are what we build the budget off of. They help us kind of get an idea of what the income for the church is for the year that allows us to build that budget. So these are extremely critical and we ask that if you have not built one of these out, please do so uh, and, and turn those in, and that really helps us out a lot. One of the things I want to talk about today is a goal that the Finance Committee said last year in that we hope that at some point we can get to 25% electronic giving in the church. Uh, we're a little bit short of that. We are pretty close. Um, but I thought I'd talk just a few minutes about electronic giving. So it's convenient. It's very easy to set up. It's easy to pause. It's easy to change. Um, there's, uh, it's pretty simple, it's filling out a form and attaching a voided check. It's very, very beneficial to the church as a whole because it provides consistent, reliable, and steady income. And once again, it very much helps with the budgeting process. So what are some of the, the uh, perceived barriers to electronic giving? Um, some people have said they're not sure really what to do. Once again, um, there's a gold form in each one of the pews. And it's as simple as filling this out, stapling a voided check to that uh, form, and turning it in. Sarah and I are available if you have any questions about it or any concerns with it. We can try to answer some of those questions. I've heard that people are afraid of losing control of their giving. Uh, they don't have a say over what they give anymore. And as I mentioned earlier, changing or stopping electronic giving is as easy as contacting Sarah and I, and we can usually have that request taken care of that day. We, we simply uh, talk to the accountant and they, they change the amount or pause it or stop it altogether if that's what needs to happen. And finally, I think there's a, a cons people are concerned about the perception that they're not putting their offering into the offering plate every, every Sunday. And um, so what we have done, and you'll see this also in your queue, we do have a card in there that says I get electronically. It still allows you to put something in the offering plate every day. Um, so. Once again, if you have any questions about electronic giving, it is very beneficial to the church, um, and I'm always available to answer any questions about it. So with that, thank you very much. We do give thanks to God today for all the blessings and the family and the beautiful weather that we have today, and it's in that spirit of giving that we invite the ushers to come forward for offering.
Lord, we pray for the leaders of our nation and the leaders of the world to continue to pursue, pursue peace with one another, to continue to pursue justice for those that are marginalized, to continue to lead and guide us with your grace and love. We pray for the leaders of our community, Lord, that you surround them with and sustain them. We pray for the first responders that respond to situations and throughout the world and the nation and in our community here. We pray specifically today for Fernand Shaw, your, your help, help healing touch to, to be extended to her through the medical team that is caring for her and treating her. We also lift up the Jewish synagogue in Pittsburgh, Lord, we pray that her voices here in Silver Lake and the voices across the nation can be voices that speak out against anti-Semitism, that speak out against hate and violence, empower us, strengthen us, and give us courage. We pray for the families of those victims, for their, their peace, to comfort them, and to embrace making your presence known to them. Lord, we pray for those who are amongst us today that are dealing with health issues, that are underemployed or unemployed. Lord, we pray that you make your presence known to them. We pray for the Shaw family as they grieve the loss of that. We pray for the crumps as they Grieve the loss of Sandra. <coughs> May your comforting embrace sustain them. We pray all these things in the same way that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread.
I also wanted to announce that there are also there are stems from the bazaar and also other items from the bazaar that are available for you to look at and purchase uh, in the fellowship hall uh, after worship as you join each other in fellowship over snacks and treats. But I also want to offer you an opportunity. And that opportunity is that as you leave, there is a whiteboard, whiteboard in the foyer. And this is how you can shape the next couple weeks of the sermon. I want to know what issues you think are the ones that divide us. And so there's two white race markers out there, dry race markers out there for you just to, to write. If you see some, see what you want to write up that's already up there, just, just maybe put a check mark by it, but I am willing to encourage you to write something on there so we can talk about things that are important to each one of us in this room. There's a lot of issues that divide us, especially coming with the political election coming out, but I'm going to look at those and see, hey, what, what does Jesus say about these issues? And begin to have a discussion about that. And so, please bow for the benediction. God, be our vision. Be our vision for the future so that we may extend your love, grace, compassion to all those we encounter. Amen. Amen.